You know, the, the, the human mind is occupied with uh, so many different kinds of concerns. And the human heart is driven by ambitions and anxieties and fears and self-interest. And so uh, one of the things that Jesus has done in the Sermon on the Mount is actually to speak to the heart. Already as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, we've, we've seen that even if we obey the law in a physical sense, we haven't killed anyone, we haven't lied, we haven't stolen anything, don't commit adultery, don't covet thy neighbor's assets, all of those things we kind of keep, Jesus says, even if you don't do them, lots of times the human heart, the, the attitude of the mind can be sinful. You can have a heart filled with rage. You can have a heart filled with lust and so on and so forth. And so as we go through chapter 5, we realize that, wow, even when we don't do, when we don't do anything bad, so to speak, the heart can still have a sin condition. Then as we move into chapter 6, we realize that not only um, is the heart prone for those pleasures, but it's also uh, prone for self-promotion. In, in living out our religious lives, in, um, in our piety, when we do what's just right all the time, sometimes we do what's right for the wrong reasons. We pretend to glorify God, but actually what ends up happening is that we're looking for uh, honor for ourselves. As we pray, as we give, generos uh, give generously, as we fast, that heart sometimes wants people just to notice. And then it's not for God anymore, it's for us. So the other issue that can control us at a heart level is our fears, our worries, our anxieties. And so we know that the, the human heart is geared towards its own passions, its own reactions. It's geared towards its own praise and it's geared uh, anxiously towards its own fears and, and worries or maybe away from them. Let me say this, that um, the human heart loves uh, recognition and admiration but even more than that it seeks to avoid uh, humiliation or the loss of status the human heart um, loves money loves wealth loves what you can get materialistically all the blessings that are out there but even more so the human heart seeks to avoid the loss of possessions, the experience of poverty. And so when we followed Jesus through the sermon, the last thing we addressed in our, in our last week was that you cannot serve two masters. Jesus says you'll either love one and hate the other, or be devoted to one and, and despise the other. So you can't serve God and wealth. Neither can you serve God and your own ego. Neither can you serve God and your fears and anxieties. And so when Jesus begins this next session, he says, it's for this reason. That reason is because you cannot serve two masters. Let's read what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. This is what Jesus says. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink or worry about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food? Isn't the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow, they do not reap, they do not gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not 
worth much more than they are? And who of you by being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about what you're going to wear? Observe the flowers of the meadow. They do not toil. They do not spin. Yet I say to you, not even King Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these. So if God can clothe the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what we'll eat or what we'll drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles, the secular nations, eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. So, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will care for itself. Every day has enough trouble of its own. So there's a way that we kind of know that anxiety doesn't help anything. I mean, at a head level. Uh, we, we understand that it can be a destructive thing in our everyday life. I think that that's um, something that's known outside the church, that's known commonly. I think of, uh, it's a great song, by the way, Pick Me Up Hit, around 1988, 1990, somewhere in there. Bobby McFerrin wrote a song. He said, uh, he said in life, everybody has trouble. Um, but if you worry, you make it double. So don't worry. Be happy. I really like that song. It's got a good, you know, don't worry, be happy. And there's that, do, 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 do. Oh, I love that part, right? That's fun. So, thanks. I don't know who clapped, but I appreciate it. I actually, when I was living in Africa, I transla translated that into um, Chichewa, so I can sing that song into Chichewa. I had to make it rhyme. It was a lot of work. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, Osadanda Ula, Sangalala, hey, same, same. So. Um, it didn't go over very well. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's just avoidance, isn't it? There's no basis for not worrying. It's just like, ignore your problems. Don't dwell on them. Like, stop worrying. Just be happy. Life's going to be okay. And so what I think about Bobby McFerrin as much as I like the song is that the, um, there's no basis for his claim. You can't just stop worrying um, because it's bad for you. There's got to be a reason not to worry. And so this is how Jesus goes much deeper um, than Bobby McFerrin because Jesus uh, says that there, the reason that we can uh, not worry is because we have faith in a trustworthy, capable, and loving Heavenly Father. Right? The reason that we don't have to worry is because God's got our back. And so that's the, the critical foundational point that's behind everything that he's saying. So when he says, don't worry, which is one of the main commands in here, he says it three different times, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, right? The other command he gives is, that's central is seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, right? So if you're seeking both the, the challenge or the command not to worry and the command to seek are based on the same truth that God is trustworthy. He's capable of taking care of us. He loves us. He's got our back. And so that's... Um, that, I want that truth to kind of uh, permeate your understanding. Because what happens in religious situations like ours, in, in communities, um, is that 
anxiety creates avoidance. And, and we, we get anxious about all kinds of things. And so we say those important verses, those promises of scripture, like Romans 8, 28, right? God will work all things together for good. It's a promise of scripture. Claim it, right? For those who, who love God, who are called according to his purposes. Then it goes on to talk about how he's, he's called us, he's adopted us, he's gonna transform us. And that's where we get a little bit worried. That's why most people only quote 28 and not 29 and 30. Because the end of that thought process is that we will be conformed into the image of his son. And see, that's one of those things that, that we have anxiety about. We don't like change. It's far too vulnerable for us to come under the hands of an all-powerful God who can control heaven and earth and, and to submit to his work in our lives. A, a work that's, that's turning us, that's going to change us. That's fearful. In fact, a lot of the things that happens in institutional religion, so to speak, in our religious practices, is avoidance of, of the real faith experience. See, this is great because I can teach from the scriptures a lot of people at once. But I'm not talking about, not naming names. I'm not getting into your business. And then in the small group, sometimes you feel this pressure not to like share too much. If you overshare, then that could be a place where there's confrontation or conflict or division. And so what we end up doing is keeping our faith at somewhat of a surface level. Anxiety creates avoidance so that we evade as a, a collective group the deep things of God. And that's why this passage is so important because if we're going to seek him first and we're going to seek his righteousness, one of the things we have to, we have to give up is our anxiety. The, the master that controls us is the master who has us living in fear and doubt and worry, right? That's why the Proverbs say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's to understand that, that even though it's a fearful thing to be into the hands of a redemptive God that's gonna transform your life in ways that you may not expect or you may not want, it's wise because fearing everything else will just lead you away from kingdom seeking. All those other anxieties. So when I read this passage the first time through, there's this great command for scripture that I try to take very seriously. It says, consider the birds of the air. I was like, oh, I got that. I'll bird watch all day long. Right? That's the easy one for me. But the point for considering the birds is that they don't work. They don't plant, they don't harvest, and somehow God's found a place for each one of them. I used to teach, uh, I had one lecture a year at the um, ecology club at University of Nairobi, and I would talk about how every, every species of bird, I'd go through all these pictures, they love my pictures, pictures of, of raptors with a hooked bill, pictures of seed eaters with a big triangular shaped bill and I'd explain how all these bills are designed by God and then the instructor would correct me later. You know, they evolved that way. But all of these, these birds, each one of them had a different shaped bill designed for a different niche. In fact, God had the whole ecosystem in mind and he said, this one is a provision for this bird. This is a provision for this bird. This is a provision for this bird. So when I consider the birds, I realize that God has provided food for every kind of bird, every species. Something to marvel at, really. So when we look at this, this passage and we, we try to want to move away from that 
avoidance of what's really real, that anxiety of, of releasing control. You know, what we realize with God is when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If God's will is to be perfectly done on earth as it is in heaven, what does that mean about my will? What does that mean about my agenda? What does that mean about my plans? What does that mean about what I want? What I think I need? You see, ultimately, for God to be in control means that I'm not. And that's why we seek after money and honor and all those other things that God has, that Jesus has said that we should abandon. The reason we want to serve those masters instead of the almighty God is because there's some way we feel like we can control money. We feel like, we feel like we can control our reputation, our image, but we know at a very fundamental heart level that we cannot control an uncontrollable God. To put our lives in the hands of an of a all-powerful other is a very fearful thing. So there are some wonderful little pieces of advice in here that give, uh, give us little comfort. Jesus says, so actually, how many of you added an hour to their life by worrying about it? That's the Bobby McFerrin piece, right? Don't worry, be happy. That doesn't help you out. Or my favorite one is, don't worry about tomorrow. Have you, have you noticed how, what anxiety does? Is you just have a, a long list of worries, uh, uh, multi anxiety and you just go from one day to the next to the next and you start thinking down the road this if this then this this and you, and you start to spiral all out of control Jesus says don't worry about tomorrow today's got enough trouble for itself like Jesus is not very encouraging when he tells people not to fear not to doubt not to worry in other places he says don't worry about those who can only kill your body you should fear the one who can kill your body and throw your soul in hell Oh, so as a missionary, when we were actually worrying about some of these things, safety and security, I thought, like, don't worry about those who can only kill the body. Wow, that, that's not like, that's not a promise that you're going to keep me alive, right? <laughs> don't worry about tomorrow. You got enough trouble today. Worry about that. Like, oh, great. So today is bad. Now it gave me something else to worry more about. But what Jesus is pointing to is that those worries are futile. They're out of your control. It doesn't matter. Come back to the present situation. The present situation is that you have a God who knows what you need, who takes care of flowers and birds that are much less important than human beings. He'll take care of you. So I'm going to go on a little rabbit trail today because this is one of my favorite little things about Matthew's gospel. Um, Jesus has a funny way of talking to people. It's like he uses nicknames. I like it. So Peter, he's like, was Simon before? He's like, now I will call you Peter the Rock. So like his buddy, he calls Rocky. I sort of think of Peter like running out the stairs and being like, ooh, right. He's Rocky. And, And actually, that's his position. He's... He's the one who runs up in front of everybody else. James and John, at some point they talk about praying down, you know, fire from heaven on people, and maybe that's why he calls them the sons of thunder. You know, he gives people nicknames. But this passage, we get one of my favorite nicknames for the disciples. The little faith ones. You of little faith. It's one word in Greek. Ali... Pistoi, the oligopistoi. So we're going to follow that theme of oligopistoi in Matthew today because I think it's significant that Jesus refers to his disciples as, oh, you oligopistoi, oh, you little faith ones. There's something about the, to be a disciple of Jesus, you, you need just a little bit of faith. 
So it's not based on the, the proof that the religious leaders demand. It's based on a little bit of faith. Here's what I love about Matthew's gospel later. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it out of order just so that you guys can be uh, relieved in the moment of anxiety here. Is that later, uh, Jesus says in Matthew um, 17, 20, he says that if you have just a, a little bit of faith, the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. You can command this mountain to go in the sea. It'll happen. It just takes a little bit of faith. Which is important to know because the oligopist toy aren't void of faith. This is the good news. It's not you of no faith. It's you of little faith. Your little seed of faith. And so here he tells them, you of little faith, don't seek after all those things like the secular nations do. Because your Father in Heaven knows what you need. So I want to follow this theme of oligopistoi, and it goes back to, to something I think that mo- Jesus models in his own life even before he has disciples. After his baptism, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, drives him into the wilderness where he is tested uh, by the devil for 40 days. He fasts 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. This is Matthew chapter 4, if you want to make a note to look it up later. But what happens is, um, this is the biggest understatement probably in the book of Matthew. And it says that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, after which Jesus was hungry. And I'm always thinking like, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense, right? I would be hungry too. So after 40 days, 40 nights, Jesus was hungry, and that's when the devil approached him and said to him, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. But Jesus performs performs no miracle. He will not be self-centered in filling his stomach with bread because that's not why he went to the wilderness. He did not go to the wilderness to satisfy his stomach. He went to the wilderness for spiritual nourishment. And so his response to the devil is, it is written, a person shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, Jesus wants more than for us to depend on God for our daily bread. That's, that's the shortest little line in the Lord's Prayer. Give us today our daily bread. For sure, physical needs. We want to depend on God for. But he also wants us to go beyond that and depend on him for our spiritual nurturing. His word. We will thrive when we feast on his word. So I'm going to follow this little bread theme a little bit because bread and word are kind of played together in Matthew, and I hope you enjoy the ride. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has a, a moment with the disciples where he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So for us to get this story, we actually have to know two other stories. It's not part of the sermon, but you've got to have the background, so I'm going to give it to you. So the problem that the disciples have is when he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, they think it's because they didn't bring bread with them. And Jesus has to remind them about like, their experience with him and bread. So if you're in chapter 14 of Matthew, there's this great... Uh, moment where Jesus goes out into the wilderness and f- over 5,000 people come to hear to, to, just like Jesus went out into the wilderness to get spiritual nutrients, not physical nutrients now he has a multitude of over 5,000 people who go out to hear the teachings of the Lord and guess what, in the wilderness food is scarce so at the end of all of it Jesus takes five loaves of bread and multiplies that and feeds the whole crowd. 
happens again. The next chapter. Another wilderness. Another group of people. Just coming to hear what Jesus has to teach. And at the end of it, he takes seven loaves of bread and multiplies it for 4,000 people and everyone has their fill. And in each place, there's abundant baskets of leftovers. So when we get to 16, Matthew chapter 16, verses five and following, um, Jesus says, beware of these, the leaven of these religious leaders. See, what they wanted was a sign. They wanted to, to live by, by proofs, not by faith. And Jesus tells them, beware of the leaven. And so leaven is like a component of bread. It's like the yeast in bread that makes it rise. And so the metaphor is not that complicated. The metaphor is that if you have, uh, just like you put a little bit of yeast into a bunch of bread, it leavens the whole loaf and the whole loaf rises, that a little bit of false teaching, a little bit of wrong orientation in the teaching of the word of God can have an ill effect in the whole loaf. So that's what Jesus is focused on, is their understanding of the word, their understanding of his teaching. And he says, beware of those guys. And because they forgot a loaf of bread, they go straight to the literal. And they're like asking each other, like, is this because we didn't bring bread? Is this, is this why? And then Jesus says, remember, how many baskets did you pick up after the 5,000? How many baskets did you pick af- up after the 4,000? Understand that I'm not talking about bread. I'm talking about something more. And in that passage, uh, let's turn real quick to Matthew 16. I want to get the right verse. Sixteen eight. Jesus, aware of what they were saying, said, you Oligopistoi. Why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Right? You of little faith. You little faith ones. Jesus is saying, why are you still worried about this daily bread thing? Just put that in the prayer, say it, and God's going to take care of it. Stop worrying about daily bread. Instead, focus on getting your spiritual nutrients. Focus on seeking the kingdom. Focus on seeking his righteousness. And these things will simply be added unto you. You don't need to worry about them. You have a good, good, heavenly father. He's in control. He's powerful. He cares about you. He's capable. He will provide for you. So as we move through this, these passages, we realize that um, what Jesus has been preaching about in the Sermon on the Mountain all along is true. It's consistent. Why heap up meaningless phrases why worry? You guys know how to give your kids good food. When they ask for, for bread, you don't give them a stone. When they ask for a fish, you don't give them a snake. If you know how to do what's good, of course, your Heavenly Father can do better than that. So it's one thing, actually, to sort of trust God with our provisions. God's got it. We're going to eat. Even though at times we might feel hungry, we we know that that God's got it. He's going to take care of us. It's a whole other thing to trust him when things are scary. Right? It's one thing to say, oh yeah, I know, he can, uh, we're going to get our food. We're going to have food at the table. That's okay, I'm not worried about that. It's another thing that, that when you're in a dangerous situation that you believe that your Heavenly Father will protect you. So there's these two other passages where Jesus used that term, you, you little faith one, that I, I like to bring up because both of them happen. Uh, they're very similar stories, two separate stories. Uh, 
and it occurs on a stormy sea. In the first story, chapter 8, um, Jesus has just been explaining to the disciples who would be there, his followers that you're, there's a cost to discipleship. He says, Go, you, you have to let the dead bury the dead. You, you're going to have to you're going to have to put priority on the kingdom over your family obligations. Also, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. I'm not promising you a home. So what's most important is that as you become a kingdom seeker, that home and family become secondary. And when they consider the cost, Jesus orders his disciples to get into the boat. And those who are his disciples obey and they get in the boat and here's where it gets scary Jesus falls asleep in the boat storm fierce wind waves it's swamping the boat it's filling up they wake him up they're like don't you care we're about to die and he rebukes the wind he rebukes the waves it's dead calm would that be something to see like a raging storm at sea, and then calm, dead calm. And Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you fear? You ole gapistoi, why fear? I'm in the boat with you. You forget who's in the boat with you? Fast forward to chapter 14. This one's a little bit more scary. Jesus isn't in the boat. It's just the disciples. And the Bible says that the the storm, the wind is against them. They're struggling at the oars. They're fighting the fierce wind and the waves that are crashing around. And Jesus walks out to them on the water. It's miraculous. They're terrified. They think it's a ghost. They cry out in fear. Jesus says, don't be afraid. I am here. Take courage. The coolest part about that story is Peter is in the boat and Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out of the boat and he literally walks on the water. How awesome is that? If you're not, if you're concerned like can God provide for my food? Can God provide for my drink? Can God provide for my clothing? It should be answered right here. Jesus says, Peter, come, come here. And Peter walks on the water. And in his fear, with that fierce wind that's against him, he just starts to, to sink. And Jesus reaches out and, and grabs him. Here's the words that I want you to hear. He says, Oh, you of little faith, Why did you doubt? You see, Jesus calls those who struggle with sin to repent. And he calls those who struggle with fear and doubt and anxiety to trust him. There are a couple of other characters that I like in the Gospel of Matthew who exhibit great faith. They're not disciples. They're not even Jewish. One is a a Canaanite woman. She has a a daughter who's possessed by a demon and she, she comes before the Lord and she pleads for help and the Bible says, here's the word and bread thing again. The Bible says that Jesus did not give her a word. But she persisted and the disciples said, come on, deal with her. She's, she's causing a scene. And Jesus responds to her and says, why is it right for, um, for someone to give the children's food, the children's bread to the uh, dogs? What I love about this woman is she takes no insult. She's not offered a place at the table, but she's content to take in humility a place under the table at the feet of Jesus. She says, oh, yes, Lord, that's true. You're right. 
But guess what? Even the dogs enjoy the crumbs that fall from the table. I wonder if Jesus' greatest miracles, if God's greatest miracles in us are things of seeds and crumbs. Little mustard seed of faith. Little, little crumb of nourishment. This is a metaphor again. Jesus spiritually restores her daughter. The centurion knows that in, in chapter 8. He, he says when Jesus is coming to heal his servant, he says, no need to come to my house. Your word's enough. I understand authority. It goes down the chain from, from the top to the bottom. I've got a boss. I've got servants. If you make an order on the, the chain of command, it will be followed. And Jesus is amazed at his great faith. He doesn't need a sign. He doesn't need Jesus to show up. He just says, a word's enough. And Jesus speaks. And in that moment, his servant is healed. So I want to talk about us. The Ali Gopistoi. The Ali Gopistoi, the little faith ones with our little mustard seed of faith. God uses that kind of faith to transfer from lives, to move mountains, to make a difference in the world. I want to finish today with a a parable that Jesus says in um, a couple parables in chapter 13. He says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is the smallest of all the seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and has become a tree so that even the birds of the air may come and nest in its branches. The kingdom of heaven, likewise, is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until the whole bread was leaven. So, oligopistoi, my brothers and sisters, Let's not follow a pattern of anxiety and avoidance. Instead, let's enjoy the freedom of knowing that our God can take the little bit that we have, the little faith that we have, and use it to move mountains, to change the world, that we might reach out like branches of a mustard seed And those from east and west, all the birds of the air will find shade in a genuine church that has faith, not fear, that God is for us and that it's worth being vulnerable and bearing our hearts open that he might transform us at a core level. Knowing that even if we disagree in a Bible study, that the answer for reconciliation is right here. That we can work together to follow the one who calls us to get in the boat and to get out of the boat.